a couple more paragraphs in uh, Locke's two treatises. Um, so I did section 87 in the last video. My mic cut out uh, when I got into these other paragraphs. So that's why it ended a little bit abruptly, but um, Here we go with section 135 and then 136. Um, <clears throat> there's a little bit more on that life, liberty, and estate uh, lingo, and um, maybe a couple of other little points um, that are of interest in connection with the experience of the Commonwealth, um, as as Locke and and Hobbes and uh, other Englishmen of the same time uh, experienced that ex that experiment of Republican government in their in their day. Okay, so section one thirty five. Though the legislative, whether placed in one or more, like in a monarch or in a body of parliamentarians, whether it be always in being or only by intervals, uh, though it be the supreme power in every commonwealth, yet first, it is not nor can possibly be absolutely arbitrary over the lives and fortunes of the people. Uh, yeah, so there is this issue of arbitrary sovereignty that you know we look very closely at the history here and Locke is coming down very firmly that arbitrary sovereignty, whether it's arbitrary monarchy or arbitrary rule by parliament even, is not uh, possible. For it being at, but the joint power of every member of the society given up to that person, the monarch or the parliament or assembly, which is legislator, it can be no more than those persons had in a state of nature before they entered into society and gave up to the community, for nobody can transfer to another more power than he has in himself. And nobody has an absolute arbitrary power over himself or over any other to, to, to destroy his own life or to take away the life or property of another. A man as has been proven, cannot subject himself to the arbitrary power of another. And having in the state of nature no arbitrary power over I don't know what that means. Okay, I'm going to start again. Okay, so I wanted to uh, continue on through Locke's two treatises of government and just cut, hit a couple of more paragraphs. Um, my mic cut out in the previous video, so I had to, that one's cut off abruptly, so I'm redoing this portion of it. And we're in chapter 11 with these last two paragraphs that I wanna look at. Um, 135 and 136, okay. So section 135, and, and so there's um, some more about life, liberty, and estate, life, liberty, and property, uh, which becomes life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the Declaration of Independence. And there's some things that relate to uh, the, the English Revolution that we looked at historically before, and there's also the seeds of something that will come up 
uh, when we get to Immanuel Kant. All right, so section 135, though the legislative, whether placed in one person, whether it be always in being or only by interval, though it be the supreme power in every commonwealth yet, okay, and then he's gonna have two points here. Uh, it says, though the legislative, whether placed in more, um, whether it's a monarchy or it's some body of a directorate or the parliament, and whether it's always seated or like the parliament seated in intervals, um, uh, even if it's the supreme power in every commonwealth, yet first, it is not nor can possibly be absolutely arbitrary over the lives and fortunes of the people for it being but the joint power of every member of the society given up to that person or assembly, which is legislator. It can be no more than those persons had in a state of nature before they entered into society and gave up to the community for nobody can transfer to another more power than he has in himself. And nobody has an absolute arbitrary power over himself or over any other to destroy his own life or take away the life or property of another. A man, as has been proven, cannot subject himself to the arbitrary power of another. And having in the state of nature no arbitrary power over the life, liberty, or possession, so here we have a, another rendition of this, life, liberty, or possession of another, but only so much as the law of nature uh, I don't know why that does that. Uh, but only so much as the law of nature can, uh, nature gave him for the preservation of himself and the rest of mankind. This is all he doth or can give up to the commonwealth and by it to the legislative power so that the legislative can have no more than this. Their power in the utmost bounds of it is limited to the public good of society, of the society. It is a power that hath no other end but preservation and therefore can never have a right to destroy, enslave, or designedly impoverish the subjects. Um, so he's talking about destruction of life, uh, enslavement. So enslavement is inherently a problem. Slavery is a problem. Um, or designedly to impoverish the subjects. So he's even talking about structural violence and structural oppression, structural exploitation, uh, along the lines discussed by Father Romero. Um, and he goes on, okay, so these things are, are, are forbidden uh, according to natural law. So whatever co social contract is made between the community of people and the legislator or the executive, as we would say, um, the, the or legislator cannot have an arbitrary power to enslave or impoverish in a systematic way uh, the people, or of course, to destroy their lives. The obligations of the law of nature cease not in society. Okay, so the law of nature still holds, even once you enter into society. This is controversial uh, at, at this point uh, in time, but only in many cases are drawn closer and have by human laws known penalties annexed to them to enforce their observation. Thus, the law of nature stands as an internal rule to all men, legislators, as well as others. The rules that they make for other men's actions must, as well as their own and other men's actions, be conformable to the law of nature. In other words, to the will of God, of which that is a declaration and the fundamental law of nature being the preservation of mankind, no human sanction can be good or valid against it. Okay. Uh, and he gives a footnote of a, a traditional um, bishop of the Anglican Church who, who argues otherwise. Section 136. Secondly, the legislative or supreme authority cannot assume to itself a power to rule by ex extemporary arbitrary degrees, decrees, 
but is bound to dispense justice and decide the rights of the subject by promulgated standing laws and known authorized judges. For the law of nature being unwritten and so nowhere to be found but in the minds of men, they who through passion or interest shall miscite or misapply it cannot so easily be convinced of their mistake where there is no established judge. And so it serves not as it ought to determine the rights and fence the properties of those that live under it, especially where everyone is judge, interpreter, and executioner of it too in the state of nature, and that in his own case. And he that has right on his side, having ordinarily but his own single strength, has not force enough to defend himself from injuries or to punish delinquents. That's in the state of nature. To avoid these inconveniences of the state of nature, which do disorder men's uh, properties in the state of nature, men unite into societies and they may have the united strength of the whole society to, to secure and defend their properties and may have standing rules to bound it, but by which everyone may know what is his. So this is the reason why we enter into society. Very similar to Hobbes's argument but Hobbes wanted to argue for arbitrary, um, arbitrary power of the legislator. And Locke is saying, although we do enter into a social contract, that does not give the legislator or executive arbitrary absolute power. Because the state of the law of nature still holds and the legislator or executive is still bound by the law of nature. Okay. To this end, it is that men give up all their natural power to society in order to avoid these inconveniences, which they enter into this contract. And the community put the legislative power into such hands as they think fit with this trust that they shall be governed by declared laws or else their peace, quiet and property will still be at the same time uncertainty as it was in the state of nature. Peace, quiet and property now is another rendition of this life, liberty and estate. We have peace, quiet and property. And that, that peace and quiet sounds a lot like happiness. So the rendition and the declaration of independence is very consistent with what Locke says here. Okay. All right, and then we get, you know, his version of the social contract and we get uh, his argument that the law of nature still applies. And we will see an elaboration of this in Immanuel Kant, uh, which is interesting. Okay. All right, so that's what I have for this video and I will see you in the next video.